Good evening. I welcome you to come and study the Bible with me tonight. I appreciate you uh, looking us up on Facebook and for us to be able to uh, share some more thoughts about the, uh, the, uh, the armor of God, the whole armor of God, and how important that it is to um, put every piece of armor on that we might uh, fight the good fight of faith. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to start with a prayer, and if you would, please bow with me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We're thanking you for all the good things that you have done for us. Father, we're thankful to you that you loved us while we were yet still sinners and that Christ died for us. We're thankful for the salvation that we have in him, the victory that you've given us through raising him from the dead, that he was dead, but yet is alive forevermore now, sitting at your right hand till he's, you subdue all his enemies under him. And Father, we're thankful that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Be with us tonight as we study about the shield of faith. And Father, help us to always have a, a strong faith in you and a faithfulness in doing your will. And Father, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most important pieces of equipment that a Roman soldier had was his shield. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to quench the fiery darts uh, of the wicked. And the modern translations add the term one to supply the thought that what Paul is talking about is the fiery darts of Satan. I want to remind you of a a story that I shared with you back a few uh, weeks ago about Sabinus. Uh, Sabinus was a great Syrian soldier. He was the one that uh, volunteered when Caesar called us, uh, uh, Caesar Titus called for volunteers to go and to uh, try to take the wall. And he was one of 11. He was the first one to jump up and say that he would go. He volunteered to do it. He hoped that good fortune would follow his courage, but if not, he willingly laid down his life for Caesar. Sabinus then went to the wall, taking his left arm. He held his shield over him to guard him as he scaled up the wall. And as they were throwing darts down upon him from every different angle, uh, the 11 that went with him, they, the Jews rolled huge stones off the edge of the wall. They threw everything at Sabinus that they could, but with that shield protecting him, Sabinus gained the top of the wall. It was something, of course, and I told you the story about his ill fate as far as that once he reached the top of the wall and he was heading toward them, that he stumbled and it caused a great noise and the Jews turned around and they saw that he had fallen and that nobody else had followed him up the wall. So then they turned and began to fight with him till he died. Uh, but his bravery uh, was spectacular. But I noticed in the story, the thing that stood out to me is how that shield protected him, making him able to ascend the wall and then to get on top of the wall. And I was thinking about this very passage that Paul says, and using the terminology above all, taking the shield of faith. And in that concept of faith that's so important that if you and I are going to overcome the fiery darts of Satan, if we're going to quench them, it's going to be done with the shield of faith. Uh, much like the, the Jews did in the siege of Jerusalem, Satan will throw everything that he can at us, all the darts that he can from every angle possible. Now, in the Romans' armory, the shield... Uh, particularly this one that would have been used most of the time in the first century by the foot soldier. It was a shield that was approximately uh, 41 to 48 inches long. It was about two and a half feet wide and about 12 to 16 inches deep because actually the shield was curved and, and they curved the shield so that they might be able to stand it on the ground. And then when they put it on the ground, it would stand up. It offered them protections against the darts of warfare of that day. 
Uh, to give you an example of what that, it's interesting to me that Paul uses the terminology fiery darts of the wicked one. Uh, the Romans uh, used a, a short spear that they would shoot. Uh, many of them were metal tipped. They could be dipped in oil or tar and they were lit on fire and they were shot from a scorpion. And a scorpion was a, a siege weapon uh, that looked a lot, especially the smaller one is the one I'm talking about. Uh, it looked a lot like a, a, an, an extra large crossbow and it could fire a dart hundreds of yards. And those darts, especially when uh, uh, they were in a siege or they were trying to slow down uh, an army coming against them, uh, those darts could be very deadly. And a matter of fact, it was very important with of course, the armor that the Roman soldier wore uh, is like the breastplate that we talked about last week. Uh, and that armor was so very important, but it was very important that that shield caught the dart because the shield could kill the soldier if it was not stopped by, or excuse me, the spear could kill the soldier if it was not stopped by the shield. And so this concept of battle would have been something that a first century Christian was very uh, familiar with, but he calls it the shield of faith. This represents the shield that our trust, our faith that we have in God. It also carries with it the idea of a resolute attitude that we have in faithfulness. Uh, you remember that Jesus started uh, this set of scriptures off with, uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might talking about how important that our faith is. And Paul talked about this a lot in his writings. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, you remember that he wrote to Timothy and said, For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed against him, uh, with him, to him against that day. And I want you to think about in that, that Paul, that confidence that he's, displaying that he's talking about that he has in the Lord and that he has in God because he has absolute confidence in that God will keep that which he has committed unto him and against that day. And so he had that, that assurance of that final salvation. And you remember he wrote like in Romans 8 and 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Or like in Romans 8 and 37, Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so the idea that we win a surpassing victory uh, through him that loved us and through God, uh, we're able to overcome every uh, temptation, every trial, every persecution that Satan puts us through. Now, this confidence that we have is based upon the fact of something that the Hebrew writer talks about in Hebrews chapter 1, 11 in verse 1. In Hebrews 1 and 11, here the Hebrew writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, or it's the assurance of things hoped for, and it is then the, the conviction of things that are not seen. One of the most important concepts that we have in this idea of faith is not that we trust in ourselves, but we trust in this almighty God who has delivered us through his son, Jesus Christ, who loved us so much as John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we have this great confidence in God because we realize what God has done in giving us this gift of Jesus upon the cross. And then when we think about that, we realize that what is God's attitude? He says in 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So this confidence that we have in God, this knowledge that God is for us who can be against us. So he'll help us overcome our enemies. And all that we face will be more than conquerors, will more than overcome if we have faith in him. And so that, that's such a strong concept in the scripture. I want to read to you what Kittle said 
in a paragraph when he was writing about the definition of faith. Thus, on God's side, what faith involves is his power, his love, his steadfastness, righteousness, choosing, and demanding might all be covered, namely everything that makes him God, so that in the covenant context, unbelief is tantamount, tantamount to apostasy. On the human side, faith involves knowledge, will, and feeling with an element of fear as well as an attitude of extensive and intensive commitment that embraces the totality of external conduct and inner life. Now I want to deal first with this idea of what is he pointing out when he says on God's side? He's talking about God's power. He's talking about God's love, his steadfastness, his righteousness, his choosing, but also you'll notice he used the word demanding. That is, God expects things of us. And, and so in this is absolutely, he's saying you have to know God because your faith is going to be in God. I want to read to you. This is taken out of Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. And this is Isaiah's um, commissioning as a prophet of God. And I want you to notice where God starts with him. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And he cried, they cried one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We just had a couple return uh, back from uh, Portland, Oregon, and around that area. And they were just talking to me how many beautiful things that they saw uh, while they were gone. And, and I, I couldn't help when I read this verse to remember that the whole earth is full of the glory of God. He says, at the post of the door, or in the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am done done, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. The thing that stands out to me about this is you notice, first of all, God is displaying his glory and his honor and his power as Isaiah is able to see him as he's there in his throne room. And he's able to see the glory of God in his majesty. And this causes Isaiah to look at himself and here he stands in awe of God and it fills him with guilt because here is the holy God where the seraphim is saying, holy, 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 repeating it three times. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. And so he's standing in all of this. And in standing in all of it, it makes him reflect upon himself. And he realizes his uncleanliness. He realizes his sinfulness. And of course then, by the story, God takes care of that. Well, now he needs to commission somebody to go and to teach and to prophesy to the children of Israel. And so he calls about, whom shall I send? And he said, here am I, send me. And so what a wonderful attitude that you see in Isaiah. But first, what God establishes with Isaiah is something that Vines talks about that's involved in faith. A firm persuasion, a conviction based upon hearing. And then he references Romans 10 and 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You remember in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 6 where it says, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it is a belief in God. Our faith is centered upon him. We are convicted of him. That's why that hearing the word of God is so important. 
Because the way in which that we know God is found in his word. That is, you and I can look at creation and we can know there's somebody powerful, there's somebody great that made the creation. So we understand that he has great power. But it's only found through the study of his word that we learn about his righteousness, that we learn about what is it that God loves. We learn about his steadfast love. We learn about what is his will. How do we please God? How do we do the things that, that will be well-pleasing to him whereby that we might be saved? And so all of that is learned by the Word of God. So really when Paul talks about that, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, that we are going to be convicted by God's Word. We have to take that into our heart. We have to see Him as He truly is. Isaiah couldn't prophesy about God until he knew God. For you and I, that comes through looking at his word, studying it, diligently studying it, learning of him, learning about him, applying ourselves to that. That's why Paul would emphasize to Timothy, and he would say, study to show yourself a prudent in God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so it is that diligence in, in studying God's word we learn about him, and then we, we embrace what we learn and what we know about him. Now, in the gospel, there's some important points that have to be made about that because one of the paramount things that we're going to learn as we study the gospel is we learn about Jesus, who is the Son of God, because the greatest picture that we have of God, the ultimate revelation of God, is found in Jesus Christ. When you look at John chapter 14, beginning in that chapter in verse 6, I want you to listen to what Jesus said about himself. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now listen to his wording. If you know me, you should have known my Father also. From henceforth you know him and had seen him. Now listen to what Philip says back to him then. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it satisfies us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say then, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. So he's pointing to them to this, that when they had seen him, they seen God, because Jesus is of the same nature as God, and God is his Father. And so the emphasis that he's showing is that here he is, he's with them, he's done all these great miracles that they have seen, and he said, if nothing else, Philip, just don't take my word for it, If just believe for the work's sake. Look at the miracles that I've done and believe what the miracles testify to. What they say about my nature and who I am and my power and where I come from. Now, another important concept that we see in this as far as the gospel is concerned. We know, as we looked, talked about earlier in John 3.16, 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But what also we could realize is, and we understand from what the gospel teaches us, that Jesus died for us upon the cross. God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners or still sinners, Christ died for us. So, so one of the Godhead came down here upon this earth, and he died upon the cross, living a perfectly innocent life. And so he died for us. But when he died, then on the third day, Jesus raised up Jesus from the dead so that our faith then rests in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, showing God's power over death. Now, I want you to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have also received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, 
if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we have this, and we have this proof, and it's very important as far as our own faithfulness, as far as our own willingness, if it's necessary to even die for the cross of Christ, it's our motivation for being uh, faithful unto death. And so that's very important that we understand in God's manifestation of his power. And you, you think about it, you, you have that glory and that power is manifest um, toward uh, Isaiah so then that Isaiah can go forth and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then for you and I, we have the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that God raised him from the dead, and it exhibits God's great power that he has. I want to remind you, we looked at this when we studied the words power, but I want you to think where Paul went. In Ephesians chapter 1, and he's prayed for the Ephesians to have understanding and wisdom in the word of God. He says in verse 19 of Ephesians 1, Ephesians chapter 1, beginning verse 19. And now listen to what he says because you can see that, that importance of you have God's demonstrated power. He says, and what is it? The exceeding greatness of his power to us were to who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and has set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is his name, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what you have is Isaiah saw the throne room of God and saw God's glory. What you and I know, because we see it through the eyes of faith, we see what God recorded for us by his eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Then you see the manifold wisdom and power of God as it's been exhibited in God's power that he raised Jesus from the dead and Jesus is sitting at God's right hand. Now, Paul's emphasized this shield of faith. And this shield of faith is our faith in God's power as it's been manifested in bringing salvation to us. Made known in the gospel. Remember the apostle Paul, Romans chapter one and verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. And it, so it's found in that message of the death of Christ and that message of his resurrection from the dead. It's found in you and I being persuaded of that, this causing us to have faith in God's power because Jesus has all dominion, the scripture says there, far above, far above all principality. Well, whose power is also Christ's power over in God's? It's over Satan's. So that in that idea of that shield of faith, then that Roman soldier, he used that shield. In fact, they could also form a tortoise if they had to. And that was a bunch of soldiers uh, that got in a certain form where there were shields formed all the way around the perimeter. And also there'd be soldiers that were holding their shields up like that on the top of it. So it was like a tortoise shell. That's where the name came from. that protected them from uh, darts and arrows and stuff like that as they moved across the battlefield. But in this, what this is emphasizing is that, that Jesus and God's power he's exhibited is far above, far above. God is so much more powerful than Satan. You cannot, you and I can't even imagine it. And that power is used for us. Because remember, in Ephesians 6 and 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But you and I must have faith in God. We must trust in God. Our confidence has to be in him. It, it has to be like the patriarchs were in the Old Testament. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, there's a statement made there about them. And it's one that needs to be true of you and us, you and I. 
He says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You and I have the promises of God. We have to be persuaded of them. We have to embrace them. We have to be convicted of them. And they have to change the way that we live our lives externally and also internally as well. This faith caused people in the Bible to have great courage. In Hebrews 11 and verse 8, when Abraham was called by God, the scripture says there, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham's faith was so great in God and in his power that when God told him to leave his homeland, or the Chaldees, and then ultimately when God called him then from Haran too, then he went down into the promised land, and he went there, and he didn't even know where he was going. God was going to show him, but he was willing to go because of his faith that he had in God. So he knew that God would take care of him. You remember, faith is something that is very important, for we walk by faith and not by sight. There's a verse right before this one in Hebrews 11 and verse 7. You remember the story of Noah when Noah was commanded by God to build an ark. And in Hebrews 11 and 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with, with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So what this tells us in this is that that again, you have this concept that's found in Noah. You see it again in Abraham. But in Noah, Noah had to build the ark before the flood came. And so he went ahead and he built the ark. And then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights after he had preached approximately 120 years. So you have this idea of faith where they stepped out in faith because they believed what God said. And even though the flood wasn't there yet, some believe it hadn't even rained yet. We don't know for sure about that, but there's an indication in Genesis that the earth was, was watered by a mist that arose. So even the concept of rain, that may have been the first time that they had seen rain as we know it today. But whatever it was, they'd never seen a flood like the one that took place that God brought about. And the preparation for it had to be done ahead of time. So they had to take God at his word. And so what God's done in Christ presents us as that conviction that he will keep the promises that he's made to us in Jesus Christ, his son. Now, when we say this too, how strong was Abraham's faith? You remember with Abraham that God commanded him to offer Isaac, his son, upon an altar as a burnt sacrifice. And there again, Abraham did it. In Hebrews 11 and 17 through 19, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises opened up his only begotten, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall your seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from where also he had received him in a figure. So in Abraham's way of thinking, he knew that Isaac was the son of promise, but yet God was commanding him to offer Isaac as a burnt offering to him. Abraham traveled to Mount Moriah to the place that God had told him, and he had actually built the altar. He had tied Isaac upon the altar. He had raised a knife over him when the angel of the Lord stopped him. But why Abraham did that? is because he accounted, the only thing he could figure was, if Isaac was going to be the son of promise, just as God has said he was, then God was going to raise him from the dead. And so Abraham was willing to do that because of that confidence that he had in God. So for you and I, 
The thing that this shield of faith provides for us, the thing that, that, that faith produces in us is that it produces obedience. In Abraham, it was, go to a land, I'll show you. The last part of verse 8 says, Abraham obeyed and went. And there's immediacy in that obedience that's being talked about that. And then with Isaac, he rose up early the next morning and he took Isaac. God commanded Noah to build an ark and he built an ark. We know that they did. Abraham went. Abraham offered Isaac to the point which, right to which God stopped him. And then Noah built an ark. So faith produces in us the courage to obey. The next thing that it causes in us is, it causes in us the courage to speak. When God needed a prophet through Isaiah, after he had shown him himself in his throne room, he needed someone to go. Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And so he had the courage to speak. He had the courage to say God's word, to speak God's word, to prophesy to the unfaithful Israelites and the unfaithful uh, uh, people of God and the tribe of Judah as well. The Apostle Paul was this way too. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. So faith produces in us the courage to speak the word of God. I want you to notice with me, this was something that was important to the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at this in a few weeks, but I want you to look back in Ephesians chapter 6 with me just a moment. I want to begin reading in verse 18, and I want you to listen what the Apostle Paul uh, asked of the Ephesians. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Faith causes us to speak God's word. The thing that will give us the courage to do this is this shield of faith where we'll be able to stand, we'll be able to withstand the fiery darts of Satan, where we'll be able to accomplish the will of God. Very important concept. We have to be careful to do it. Now, the next thing is this shield of faith gives us the courage to live. I want you to think about this for just a moment. You remember when the Apostle Paul was on that ship and they had been so many days they didn't even exactly know where they were at but God had told Paul that he had was sparing his life and all that were on the ship with him and you remember after that and he was speaking to them and he was encouraging them and later on he even got them to eat because he knew they were about to be shipwrecked and then he said in uh, Acts 27 and 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good courage, for I believe God that it will be even as it was told me. So there you have the Apostle Paul. He, he, he believes that God says, Paul, I'm going to spare your life and I'm going to spare everybody's life that's on that ship. And Paul believed it. And then he was there and he was convincing the people that were with him to go on and eat so that they wouldn't be weak. When they were actually shipwrecked, they'd be able to swim the shore. So you see, he had the courage to live. I want to remind you of something, that as we live here upon this earth, one of the fiery darts that Satan can throw at us, and he can throw many different ones at us, but even in the trials that we have to go through in this life, you remember James wrote in, in James chapter 1 in verses 2 through 4, he said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation or many different trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth unto all men liberally and upbraideth not. Now, when you look at that and you think about that, what it says to us, this shield of faith becomes very, very important. Because what it says is, will I be willing with the shield of faith to quench that fiery dart of Satan when he throws trials my way? Will I use that strong faith that I have in God? Will I believe in the power and the strength that God will give me that I'll be able to endure it? 
Will I have a resolute mind? Will I be like Sabinus was that, man, he was going up that wall no matter what? And he did. And he, as a pagan, did that. You and I have the living God behind us. How important it is that we come over, overcome every trial, that we understand that in every temptation, that it's important that we use God's strength to overcome every temptation. And Satan, one of those fiery darts that he'll throw at us, and it won't just be one, he'll barrage us with temptations. But, but to understand that temptation doesn't come from God, but rather uh, we of our own lusts are enticed and we're drawn away and we sin. And then when sin gives birth, forth birth, it brings forth death to us. And, and James talks about that in James chapter uh, 1 and verses 13 uh, through 15. And so you and I, we have to have a, a strong, resolute mind that we face temptation and we overcome it. You know, the Apostle Peter talked about this. I want you to, to turn with me. And there's a statement he makes in 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to begin in verse 8. It's a very familiar verse with us, but I want you to notice what he says in the ninth verse. He says, this is 1 Peter 5. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. So we see here is this Satan's presented to us there as a roaring lion. He's restless uh, and wants to devour us. But listen to what Peter says next. Peter understood how Satan worked. He, he, he had had some run-ins with Satan in his life before. He says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brothers that are in the world. So we have to resist Satan. We have to do it being steadfast in the faith is to have a growing faith, a growing faith that grows by studying the Word of God, by hearing it, by being convicted of it, and then by applying its principles in our lives. You remember that Kittle, when in his definition, talked about that external and then the inner life as well. And so there has to be that, that strong desire to want to do God's will and to put our faith into action. You remember that James wrote and, 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 and he would say, uh, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James chapter 2 and verse 17. And you remember he said, yes, a man may say, I have faith and you have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. And that is that expressed faith, that faith that's made known and manifest where it's put into action or it's put into works. And one of the things that we have to realize, the thing that really cements our faith is by taking the principles of the Word of God and living those principles out every day. It's by walking in faith. It's when I, I, I face trial and when I face temptation and, and when I face the different things that happen to me in this life that that I do that with a trust in God that I'll be victorious and it's actually putting that into practice then that cements that and that's why James said even so faith if it has not works is dead. He's saying it's the expression of that faith it's when it's put into action it's really when we cement that faith and in fact I just want to remind you of this in, in 1 Timothy 4 in verse 15, after Paul had talked about uh, give Dylan's exhortation to doctrine, and he said to reading, but then down in one in uh, chapter, First Timothy chapter four and verse 15, he says, "Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly unto them, and it is by that practice of God's word you and I have learned throughout all our lives by repetition." You and I learned the ABCs because we kept saying them till we knew them. Uh, some of us that are old enough, we learned the multiplication tables because we kept saying them till we knew them. Started out by uh, one, one times one, one times two, one times all through that, all the way to 12 times 12 is usually where they usually stopped at that. But you learn that by practice. And in this concept of faith that's found here in this strong faith, I, I've told you how that the 
the, the Roman soldiers practiced every morning. Every morning they were practicing. Every morning they did these things over and over again. And what happens when you practice? You become better and better and better. And for you and I as Christian soldiers, as we're taking this armor on ourselves and, and wanting to have this strong shield of faith, this strong shield of faith comes by a steady diet of the Word of God and believing it and being convicted of it and keeping our mind focused on it. And it's that steady practice of, 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 of putting it in to place in our lives where we do practice those principles and we do those commandments that God has given us and so then we gain the strength that comes from that, of that experience. There's also in this a victory of faith. You know, the thing that gets me about Sabinus is that Sabinus ended up giving his life for Caesar. And he willingly did it. He volunteered for it. And I, there's a difference between us and Sabinus, though. Because we have the promise of victory. The Bible presents to us in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. We could translate continues to conquer the world. This is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world but he that continues to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? When we talk about this, we understand it's going to cost us. You remember Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 25, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. You remember the warnings that the Hebrew writer gave in Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 12 through 14. Take heed, my brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But I ex but exhort one another daily while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I love that statement, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. I want to read to you a section of the letter to the Hebrews. And I'm going to begin in Hebrews 11, and I'm going to begin in verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yes, moreover, of bonds and of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And these all have, have been obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided a better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. And he's going to show they though cheer us on in a certain way. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. We need to have that kind of courage, that kind of faith. We need to have the strongest shield of faith that we can have to strengthen ourselves to do the Word of God. In the end, we'll be victorious. No, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Romans 8 and 37. Would you bow with me?
O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, how great that you are. You have shown throughout all of history your great power, working on behalf of your people to bring to pass the salvation that we have today. Father, I ask that you give us hearts that are filled with zeal, filled with love, that we will focus upon you and love you with everything that we have. And Father, we will strengthen our faith so that we may overcome every fiery dart that Satan throws at us. Father, we are thankful that you are stronger than him. And when you have won the victory over him through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask you to forgive us of our sins, to forgive us of our times of doubt, our times of weakness sometimes that we face in life. Father, help us to ever cling unto you. And Father, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.